everybody. Thank you for joining us at the House at Pooh Corner with Jim Hogue. Your guest today is Ellen Brown, and I am so fortunate to catch Ellen between speaking engagements. She's just back from Korea, for example, and she'll be speaking in Massachusetts shortly, and I will be going down there with Abe Collins to listen to that speech. Um, if you don't know who Ellen Brown is, you, I'll give you a hint. You cannot go anywhere looking for alternative currencies or particularly public banking, state banking, without running head on into the name of Ellen Brown. And her prowess in that field is so well recognized that she is asked everywhere in the world to talk about what she has discovered in terms of the benefits of public banking. We have done fairly recently about five hours on this program at the House of Pooh Corner on the benefits of public banking, public money, the origins of it, going back to colonial scrip uh, before the Revolutionary War and the greenbacks and other possible and actually active examples of public money. And it seems to me that one of the reasons why the gang, the two big to fail banks, are so terribly against it is the threat of the good example. It seems to work so well everywhere that should it be accepted worldwide, it would bring an end to the big banks as we know them. So, without further ado, here is Ellen Brown. And the first thing we will talk about, I hope, is the presentation that, the subject at least, of the presentation that you will be giving on November 16th in Massachusetts. to see you next week. So, I'm sorry? I, I said I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing you next week. Oh, well, thank you. That will be a, um, that could be an, actually a, an important few minutes if, if we get to chat with Abe. And yeah. You, uh, because Abe is involved in a project that public banking public money yeah. could assist yes. greatly. And yes, so, some very interesting ideas, yep. So what's the name of the conference and um, how do you fit into it? Okay, it's a bionutrient conference and uh, people ask, <laughs> mm. or the woman that organized it, Delinda, said that somebody had said what did, you know, what did money have to do with it. <laughs> but uh, so what I'll be speaking on is how to fund their regenerative farming practices, which, so and they, they wanted me to do two workshops. Uh, actually, they wanted me to do one workshop at three hour, for three hours, and I said I didn't figure I could talk for three hours. Uh, so I'm doing two, one and a half hours each. But the first one is a deep dive into money and banking, because I really need to set that up in order to show that we can fund, we could fund the Green New Deal. Of course, I don't, that's, necessarily agree with all, all the things that are in the Green New Deal. But we could fund a universal basic income, which is one thing that's in the Green New Deal, and it would not be inflationary, and that's what I want to show. But in order to show that, first I have to go through all the steps of where money came from, what it is, there's two competing money systems, the public system and the private system, and how um, because of the private system where, where uh, governments, or sorry, where private lenders are lending money at interest, they create the money on their books. I mean, we can go into all that. I'm not sure how much you want me to go into, but anyway, that's, so my first, the first deep dive is all about the money system itself and how it works. And then, like my last slide shows that, so we can fund all these things mm -hmm. that people say are too expensive and that's why we can't do it. So what and then in, oh. in the second workshop, I'll go into those things more specifically and, um, 
the Bank of North Dakota model and um, uh, the fact that much of the much of the solutions. I mean, I personally don't even necessarily agree with the premise that carbon dioxide is the problem, but the um, but the solutions being proposed in the Green New Deal globally or the push to go green globally are not the most efficient solutions. That uh, uh, the most efficient way to get carbon. Uh, Get pollution out of the air and back and get the carbon back into the ground where it belongs is plants. They've been um, um, sequestering carbon for millions of years and they've evolved specifically to do it and they're way ahead of us. I mean, we can't, no, no chemical um, type mechanical device that we come up with is going to be as efficient as plants themselves. So that, that's what I'll be talking about in a second. Mm-hmm. Second uh, workshop. What are the two times and days? Uh, it's uh, on Saturday and Sunday, the... Mm. Okay. okay, the 16th and 17th. Uh, oh, wait. Yeah, is it 16th and 17th? Yeah. Okay. Because Abe and I are planning to come down on Saturday, which is the deep dive into money. Okay. Maybe we should talk about coming down on Sunday instead when you're doing yeah, the second Yeah, no, Sunday part. would be more more geared toward what Abe is into. That's mm-hmm. that's what I want to talk about, how we can fund it. I was trying to get him to come up with the numbers for that theoretically, all you need to do is re-educate farmers and they'll see that this is better in the long run and that they should change their farming practices. But there are definite costs and the farmers just aren't going to do it without some sort of subsidy. Mm -hmm. So right now we obviously subsidize the wrong agriculture. We're subsidizing the agriculture that's doing the damage and that's polluting our food for starters and ruining our health and polluting our water, polluting the air, et cetera. So we could switch those subsidies over to regenerative farming, you know, reward farmers for farming the right way instead of the wrong way. Um, and I think that's something like uh, $20 billion a year we subsidize to Big Ag. So I'm not sure that's enough to cover what Abe is thinking about. With that. I'd love, love to be able to go into that, but I, I don't really have the numbers Mm-hmm. to know for sure and he he wrote up a four-page thing and he said you know it's just nobody really knows you got to calculate how much land is being used or, or would be used for this purpose and you know that. so yeah well that makes sense he's you know he and i are working together on my little property and so there's no way to extrapolate the individual places where he's worked into into a nation Maybe he could extrapolate a state by state, but you know, to make it work, <clears throat> to give you numbers that are accurate, it, it would uh-huh. be impossible. That, that really would be impossible, especially on a worldwide basis. It would be impossible. Um, right. Now, so, so yeah. So basically, what I, what I thought I would say is, we've got twenty billion right there. That might do it, and if not. We can fund a lot more than we think we can, and then I'll go into the whole thing about how banks create money, how the Federal Reserve could be doing quantitative easing that's directed right into the economy instead of going to the reserve accounts of banks, as the last quantitative easing did, which did stimulate something. Mm-hmm. What it stimulated was speculative investment that did not help the real economy. You know, it went to, into the stock market, into the, into the housing market, which is houses that have already been built are not part of, you know, you're not adding to productivity, you're just driving up the price, you're just bidding higher, bidding the price up higher and higher. Mm-hmm. Well, another benefit... So, so we do have... Go yeah, ahead. An, another benefit of all the quantitative easing events were higher salaries for banking executives. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and that's what the, the article I just wrote about that you that you wanted to discuss. That's that's what they're doing with the 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 potential money that they would have had and should have had to lend to small businesses. The money which 
public banks on the model of the Bank of North Dakota would be doing. They'd be in lending into the local community to small businesses, um, which would create jobs and stimulate local economy, create more taxes for the local government. But instead, what the big banks are doing now, or particularly J.P. Morgan, is instead of re-lending their excess, they're not lending their deposits, and they're not lending them to other banks like they used to do. They're not lending them on the Fed funds market, and they're not lending them on the repo market. And the reason is that they're using them to um, buy back their own stock to drive up the stock price, which rewards the executives who have all these stock options, which is one, one of their major forms of pay. Mm -hmm. So it's all very corrupt. I mean, the whole profit motive for banks that have the power to create our money is suspect. And we have to, it seems to me, the only solution really is to over, overhaul this whole system. And we're at the point in history where we've got revolutions going on globally. Everybody's unsatisfied with the... Uh, you know, the neoliberal model that I saw an article that said Latin America was not going to put up with it and they've been neoliberalized and, and their former quite functional socialist model has been uh, killed by by uh, ne neoliberal, <laughs> by us driving our, supporting our neoliberal candidates down there. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I think the time is right for a new model. And people just don't know exactly what that model should be. So that's what my latest book was about, Banking on the People. And it was a challenge put to me by the Democracy Collaborative. They wanted 50 pages on how to uh, construct a national public banking system and what was wrong, or how to, uh, how to create... Uh, what was wrong with the too big to fail model and the you know the, why regulation wouldn't work, etc. So I uh, it was supposed to be two fifty page, page papers and I went way over a hundred pages, so I turned it into a book instead. And they agreed, they published it, so that was nice. Mm -hmm. Now the neoliberal model, I find, is a perfect continuum of the colonial model described by John Perkins, where the the bankers and their representatives and the major companies, the going back, Standard Oil and um, the other Rockefeller interests would try to persuade a country, the president of a country, the executives of a country to borrow money when they didn't need to borrow money. And if they refused to borrow money, they would either assassinate them or start a war, which is what happened in the entire Middle East, from in my opinion. Could you right. talk a little bit about whether or not the neoliberal model is any different from the historic model of stealing other people's wealth? Um, yeah, that's question number one. Is the neoliberal model different than the historic model? And um, what you have noticed worldwide, or specifically when people of certain color and um, I should say anyone in the Middle East has tried to hang on to the model, which is outside of the web of debt, uh, when we look at Afghanistan and uh, Iraq and Syria and Libya, we see that all of those countries have been, or always were, outside of the Western banking system. And we see what happened to them, and we saw what happened to the attempted coup in Venezuela many years ago, and the continual trashing of any government that doesn't play by the big bankers' rules. I've said too much just now, but um, maybe you can kind of sort it out. Okay, well, first on the neoliberal model, I really don't like that term because it seems to, it's not really liberal. I mean, it's called liberal because they supposedly liberalized the laws, meaning they basically got rid of regulations and let the banks speculate 
with our money that we're that um, you know we're putting up the FDIC insurance. I mean, I have to go through the history of that a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the 1930s, when the banks collapsed, at that time we had a very strong public postal banking system, and the, the people were rushing to the postal banks and putting taking their money out of the. Um, private banks that were collapsed and putting it in, the, in their postal banks. And what Rose, but Roosevelt, you know, I guess it was actually, actually an assassination attempt on his life. I'm sure he was under a lot of pressure. But instead of propping up, what they should have done was bolstered the, the national public postal banking system, which definitely served the people. They got a nice 2% return, and it was everybody was very happy with it. But what they did instead, due to pressure from the banks, was to pass the Glass-Steagall Act, which uh, said that the government would insure the federal deposit, you know, our deposits, up to hundred thousand dollars, and now it's up to two hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars. So we, the people, are insuring our own money in these private banks. But at least the Glass-Steagall. Act said that in return, you are not allowed to speculate with these deposits. You've got to separate, you know, depository banking from um, investment banking. So that worked for a while, but then the banks, of course, putting all kinds of pressure. Um, well, it was and Alan Greenspan, who was a big, thought that this whole neoliberal model was great and that um, greed was good and that if everybody pursued his own greed, everything would work out fine. Um, under Greenspan and Clinton, and uh, we had a, a, the that part of the Glass-Steagall Act was lifted, the part that uh, required the separation of investment banking and uh, depository banking. So now the banks can gamble with our deposits, and we're still we're insuring them to do whatever they want with them, and they are not reinvesting them in our local communities. And they're not even lending them at all now, as we see with this whole repo market thing that's just now been going on, where the Fed has had to rush in and and pump money into the repo market because J.P. Morgan's not doing it. So the amount that the Fed has pumped in was exactly the amount that J.P. Morgan pulled out. That it's not, it's no longer circulating. That it was its excess reserves. So the whole whole system is based on. Banks have are lending money they don't really have, and they've got to get that money somewhere. So the shadow banks, which aren't even uh, chartered banks, so they I mean they're not licensed banks. They're not even allowed technically to create money, although they actually do. Um, the shadow banks would be like hedge funds and uh, mortgage companies, etc., that make loans, but they don't. Um, they don't. They aren't chartered banks. So the shadow banks actually use the repo market on a daily basis. So they they are funding like these. Say a mortgage company is funding long term mortgage backed securities or or long term mortgages with one day loans rolled over and over and over in the repo market, which works on a um, a, a pawn shop model where. The lender, the the borrower puts up a pawn of some sort, meaning usually a federal security, it's something, some sort of collateral, and then the, the lender takes the pawn and the borrower takes the money and the deal is the borrower gives it back the next day. So it's called the purchase and sale just so that, just so the lenders can get out of bankruptcy. <laughs> you know, they get the money first if, if there's a bankruptcy because they say, oh no, we bought it, really, we bought it. It's We're not borrowers, we're not creditors. And um, But they're supposed to do it day after day. So, so it's a very risky model. Here they are, they don't have the money, they're making these long-term loans based on relying on uh, the repo market, relying on lenders with excess money like JP Morgan to be putting their money in the repo market to make a little interest day after day. And so JP Morgan Morgan decided not to do that. They decided to use their money for their own benefit. Or you know, of course it's always for their benefit, but this is for their benefit in another way. And uh, and so the Federal Reserve, because they have this strange model where they absolutely insist in maintaining their target Fed funds rate, even though the banks don't even borrow at the, in the Fed funds bank. 
market hardly anymore. I mean, that Fed funds rate really doesn't affect very much. But the Fed thinks they have to maintain their target rate of like currently 1.8%. So to do that, when that, when that rate shot up or when the repo rate shot up, so everybody wanted to go to the repo market instead of the Fed funds market, then um, the Fed jumped into the repo market. And of course, they became the lender of last resort to all these hedge funds and very risky uh, shadow banks that aren't even, aren't even licensed banks. So that's the model we have where banks are always pretending, or lenders are always pretending to have money they don't really have. And then they have to scramble it and get it from somewhere else. And they return it day after day. So the lender and the borrower supposedly have the money at the same time. And that's why Whenever you go to the bank, even though they've supposedly lent out 90% of their deposits, whenever you go to the bank, they always have the money. Because if they don't have it, they'll borrow it. They'll borrow it real quick, quickly overnight. So it's just this sort of, it's this big fraud or big uh, illusion of money being there when it really isn't. And so we're trying, they're trying to juggle several balls at once and keep them all in the air and say, so you've got to keep debt going. And if the, borrowers pay off the debt then uh, and the and the then the money supply shrinks because the money is created as a debt and it's extinguished when the debt is paid off so the fed has to keep, keep that whole thing going so there's a better way to do the system i would say let's just acknowledge that all our money is just credit that it, it's actually created by the borrower the, you need a borrower the borrower is actually just um monetizing his own ability to repay so all all debt all money is created as a promise to pay in the future like it's even the american colonists essentially when they were issuing paper money they were saying we're going to collect it back in taxes so but right now we're going to pay all the workers and the soldiers etc and then we'll collect it back in taxes so it's always a you're always turning somebody's to promise to pay into money and that's the you go if you tried to write to pay the grocer with your iou the grocer's not going to take it but you can go to the bank and the bank will take your iou because they're going to take some collateral or they'll know who you are and where to find you and you're going to sign a nice contract and you'll agree to pay interest so then the bank gives you its promissory note in exchange for your promising I know, and there, its promissory note is something you could spend in the market. So that's the way our whole system works. So let's acknowledge that. Make the first of all, nationalize the Fed. Set up a national public banking system, which would just be like water and transportation, and electricity, and all those things that we share, and that we really, that really should be public utility. Set it up like a public utility. Nobody makes a profit. The profits go back to the local community or whoever, you know, has set up that particular bank. And um, so acknowledge that money is just credit. Anybody who is a good credit risk, give them the, the loan, <laughs> make a loan to them. You have seasoned loan officers who are just doing their job. No, no bonuses, fees, commissions, nothing special about it. Or, you know, it's not a, not a speculative, lucrative job like it is now. It's just that they're just civil servants doing, doing their job. Uh, just like when cities that now have loan funds that's what they have these seasoned loan officers that are just they look at your the bis, they look at the um, what the business has and whether it's a reliable pay and then they if so then they make the loan to the to the best best businesses they can find so it would be like that where you would um, go to your seasoned loan officer and say this is me this is how I'm going to pay it back and then the the loans would just be made uh, drawing on the deep pocket of the Federal Reserve or just drawing on the national credit. In other words, the, the banker would just make the loan or the loan officer would just make the loan, write it into your account, which is what they do now. But there's no need to scramble somewhere else to find the money to pretend that you had the money that you didn't really have or you're borrowing it from your depositor but you still owe it back to the depositor. You're borrowing it overnight on the repo market. Just acknowledge that with this just credit, I've just turned your credit into money. We think you're a good right credit risk. Go out and spend it. Try to invest in your business. Build out the business. And if we have defaults, oh, well, write them off. A little extra money is needed in the system because um, we have a system where money is created as a debt. Uh, the 
it's extinguished when the debt is repaid. Uh, but the interest, which all, all loans today are made at interest, so always more money is owed back than was created in the original loan. So debt inevitably always rises faster than the money supply, and it rises in an exponential curve faster until it, the system can't uh, sustain the debt anymore, and then it collapses. And so we have booms and busts, which necess you know are a necessary feature of our system because we don't have debt jubilees like they had in ancient Sumeria, <laughs> which I'll talk about. So anyway, I think there's a better way to design the system, but the first thing you have to know is how the system works. And once you see how it works, you, you say, hmm, why do we have to go through all that rigmarole of pretending that uh, you know we're borrowing money overnight, but here, you can use it during the day, but we'll use it at night just to meet our reserve requirement, and then we'll give it back in the day, and we'll um, just acknowledge that it's all credit, it's like a big community currency system. Money is created by the borrower and uh, the borrower and the you know a deal between the borrower and the lender, and uh, and if there are defaults, we can do just like the Chinese, just write them off. You'll have a little extra money in the system, but you need that extra money in the system. It's good for the system. Well, so what well. if uh, we have uh, <laughs> of this first half hour? We have a little more than a minute left, and um, that was certainly a comprehensive look at what's wrong with the current system and what's wrong with it actually as we speak, because the banks, like you said, are collecting whatever money they can get their hands on and buying their own stock back with it so that it makes the banks look healthier than they really are, and it it props up the whole stock market when that goes on. Um, maybe we could talk about what you suspect could happen. Like if we keep going for another half hour, we could talk about what you were mentioning in your article that could possibly happen as a result of this, and maybe we could also clarify a little bit to People, I just reread uh, Tom Seguros's some chapters by Tom Seguros about um, balance sheets of the bank. Since we were really kind of talking around that just now, um, what is bank capital versus what is liability? What is an asset, and how that what that means to you and all of us? So anyway, thank you very much, Ellen, for this wonderful half hour. And we will continue this conversation, and it will be part two of whatever we want to call it. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. Always good to talk to you. Mm -hmm.